Welcome to The Analytic Christian, the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. I'm Jordan, and tonight we're going to be looking at uh, a view of free will and its compatibility with determinism, or at least that's the, the position that will be defended. I'm joined by Dr. Guillaume Bignon. Hello, Dr. Bignon. Hey, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on. So this is actually an interview in a series of interviews. At this point, it was kicked off by Dr. Taylor Sear. He gave a kind of overview of the positions that are taken on this debate about um, the relationship between free human free will and determinism. Are they compatible? Are they incompatible? And so far, after that interview with Dr. Sear, I interviewed Dr. Dirk Perryboom, and he defended a skeptical view that humans don't have free will. Um, and so tonight, though, I want to interview someone that does think we have free will. Dr. Mignon does think we have free will, but um, his view thinks that human freedom is compatible with determinism. So we're going to um, hear him lay that, that view out in more detail and then look at some of his reasons for thinking that's true and uh, what the implications are for Christian theism. So let's go ahead and, um, and jump in here. What is your view of human freedom? Maybe more of the details here. Yes, sure. So I think that the introduction uh, material provided by the um, provided by the excellent Taylor Sear uh, will cover the the grounds that we need to affirm here. Uh, essentially, there are two related but separated questions. Uh, when we say that my view is compatibilism, uh, there's really two separate questions uh, that sometimes are mingled for un understandable reasons. Um, but there's the compatibility question, which is to ask. Is determinism compatible with determinism? Um, is sorry, is uh, is de determinism and compatible with free will and moral responsibility? So that's the compatibility question, right? So um, if determinism were true, would that exclude free will and moral responsibility? Uh, and then there's the determinism question: Is determinism actually true? So if you say that. Uh, uh, determinism is not compatible with moral responsibility and free will, and that determinism is true, then you have to reject moral responsibility and free will. Um, but technically, you could say, you know, a combination of yes and no to either of those two questions. So technically, you have four logical possible views, um, although one of them is rarely mentioned because it's not really an appealing combination. But you have the person who says, yes, free will determin and determinism are compatible. And yes, determinism is true. So that's my view. That's the compatibilist and determinist view. To say, yes, I affirm both of those things. And obviously, if I affirm that they're true, then they're compatible. Uh, then there's a person who says, no, they are not uh, compatible. So determinism is not compatible with free will and moral responsibility. Uh, and no, determinism is not true. So that would be a libertarian account to say, we are not determined uh, because if we were, that would exclude moral responsibility, but we are morally responsible. We have free will. And so therefore, um, that's, that's the libertarian position. Uh, and then there's a person who says, no, they are not compatible, uh, but yes, determinism is true. So that would be the hard incompatibilist. Um, well, the free will skeptic, although, I mean, I think that Dr. Perryboom uh, himself is a bit more modest in his affirmation of determinism. I think he is more agnostic about that question. But that combination of saying it's not compatible with determinism and determinism is true would make you uh, say that, obviously, we don't have free will. We are not morally responsible, which is affirmed by Dr. Perryboom. Um, and then there's the final combination, which is kind of unusual. I think this, that would be the person who says, yes, determinism and free will are compatible, uh, but determinism is not true. Right? So technically, that's in the, in, the, in the square of the four different, uh, the, the four different quadrants caused by our two answers to those two different questions. That's one possibility. But that's usually not very attractive um, because you want to ask what is the reason why determinism is not true in the area of our choices? And more often than not, the answer should be, well, it's not true because that's the kind of free will that God has given us. It requires indeterminism, and that's why we are uh, free. So typically, that uh, fourth quadrant in the, in the four position is not really adopted, but these are the three. 
And so my view is very much the one that says, yes, um, moral responsibility and free will are compatible with determinism and determinism is true. So you, you probably want to dig in a little bit into questions around, so what, what is free will? Uh, what, uh, you know, what is determinism? What kind are we affirming? But that's the, the big, uh, basic outlook of the position, right? Yeah, that was very clear. And I'm, I, I like the four quadrants. I can picture that. Um, so yeah, you've already said with respect to free will, what you have in mind is, uh, the kind of control that we need in order to be morally responsible agents. Is that right? right? That's what I've been, yes, that's what I've used here. And that's one of the standard ways of unpacking the phrase free will. And so, as you can see, this is very closely connected to moral responsibility. So that's why I've been saying the compatibilist view is the view that determinism is compatible with free will and moral responsibility, because I take free will in, in that context to be the control condition for moral responsibility. So to be praised or blame, you know, to be basically uh, a praiseworthy or blameworthy, that's the basic deserved sense of moral responsibility. You need some degree of control over the actions for which you are praised or blamed. And that's the kind of control, that kind of control um, is free will. That's what we call free will. When that control condition is satisfied, then you can be morally responsible. Um, so there are other conditions for moral responsibility than the control condition. Uh, typically, uh, philosophers are going to say that there are epistemic conditions. Uh, for example, you need to be aware of some relevant facts about what you're doing. Um, you know, the typical example I take is that if I pour poison in my uh, wife's coffee, but I thought it was sugar, uh, right? I, I just take the, the powder from the, the sugar jar, but it's been replaced by poison. I killed her uh, and I caused this fully and I did it freely, right? I was fully in control of my action. Uh, there, there was the control condition was satisfied, but I was missing some epistemic information. I did not know that this was poison. So you need some epistemic conditions and control condition and free will I take to be the control condition for moral responsibility. Now, uh, that's not the only use of the phrase free will. And so it's not to say that's what free will is. And if you disagree, you're wrong. It's just one fine use of the phrase. And um, if we use free will to mean something else, sometimes we can mean by free will simply the ability to choose otherwise in a certain situation. Um, so here again, that's fine. Uh, and that's where we're going to simply have linguistic differences. So I don't think that the debate hangs or fall on what we mean by the phrase. It's just that a compatibilist like me who affirms determinism is going to find himself either affirming or denying um, the, the thesis that we have free will, depending on what free will uh, is taken to mean. So I fully comfortably affirm free will in the sense that it's the control condition for moral responsibility. And I think that we satisfy it at least some of the time. Um, but if we take free will to be a sense of ability to do otherwise, while all things about ourselves inside and out are held in place, right? That's one, and one way of unpacking this ability to do otherwise then I think that in that sense, I would have to deny uh, that we have free will uh, because that, that I take to not be compatible with my view. Um, so I would deny free will in that sense, but simply qualify, okay, this, it's in that sense that I deny it. Now, mind you, there's another sense of the ability to do otherwise that we might touch on this later. There's the more um, conditional sense of ability to do otherwise, which does not quite require you to be indetermined. And so I'm still free to affirm that if that's what we take to be free will. Um, but I, I go with the standard uh, control condition for moral responsibility. And I say that we do have it. And it has the merit of not begging any questions uh, that we can say free will. Um, we agree that there is a control condition for moral responsibility. So let's call this one free will. And then let's debate whether that's compatible with um, uh, determinism or not. All that was really clear. Okay, one more thing before we move on to some of your reasons for thinking mm -hmm. this view you adopt is true. Let's clarify determinism. So yes. we clarified what we meant by free will. So what do you mean by determinism? Yeah, so uh, once again, definitions are very hard to uh, formulate at the satisfaction of everybody. Uh, but I'm going to mean something like this, that uh, everything that happens, all of our choices, all the events in this world, including our free choices, Right. Everything that happens 
is necessitated by antecedent factors. So uh, that's uh, sometimes we phrase determinism in terms of uh, the, the laws of nature or um, simply a previous state of the universe along with the uh, laws of nature um, entails the truth of everything else that will happen in the future. So the, the big idea is that it's necessitated by prior states of affair. So there's this uh, strong model claim here that basically if you take all of these antecedent factors, uh, they necessitate everything that follows. That is that the, these things that follow could not be different than they in fact will be while we hold in place those antecedent factors. So there's this, that necessitarian aspect to say those things uh, are necessitated by prior states of affairs. Now, the prior states of affairs, depending on what kind of worldview you have, that might be phrased differently. Some will phrase it in purely um, material terms to say there's the initial state of the universe along with the laws of, lo of um, the laws of nature, and that these will uh, determine all of our choices. Uh, but for a theist, it's probable you're going to more phrase this in terms of God's providential decree or providential activity. Um, so I don't really take a view as to whether the laws of nature themselves, along with the initial state of the universe, um, entails the truth of my future free choices. But I do take the view that at least when you take all of the things that are causally relevant to my choice, these together determine the outcome. And so I take God's control, right? So, I mean, for a Christian, no matter what view of free will you take, you, you believe that God is actively directing things in one, one way or another in this world, that his activity, along with everything else you take to be causally relevant for my choice, so my state of heart, my um, beliefs, the influences coming towards me, God's activity on my heart, all of that, is determined uh, is determining the outcome of my choice. So uh, I, I don't think this is excluding too many folks who wouldn't recognize themselves in that de the definition of determinism. And so that's the kind I affirm. And so I obviously affirm the theistic kind, right? I'm a I'm a I'm a compatibilist, but I'm a Christian compatibilist, and I think that's typically the view that is referred to as Calvinism, although there's conversations about whether that's the right label for this philosophical view. Um, but yeah, I take my view to be the Calvinist view. I take this to be um, determinism, compatibilism, and it's therefore a theistic kind of determinism and compatibilism. All right, very good. So now let's, we, we've laid out you, what your view is, define the terms. Now let's look at some of your reasons for thinking compatibilism is true what why do you think it's true yes so there's a lot to say uh, there's actually several things that technically i would need to establish right so when we say that my view is true there's the the belief in determinism uh, technically i also would need to establish moral responsibility um, and uh, then there's com compatibilism the thesis that those two are compatible with each other um, but uh, I think if we show that determinism is true and that moral responsibility is true, then it follows that compatibilism is true. But now it's depend it depends all on which ones you start with. Right? So if who do I have to convince of any of those three things? Uh, I can have arguments for compatibilism by itself. I could have arguments for determinism for someone who doesn't believe in determinism. And then I could have an argument for uh, moral responsibility for someone who denies that we are morally responsible. Um, so... Where do I take some, all of those and what kind of uh, reasons I have? Um, let's let's start with a decent ground and being the uh, cliche Calvinist who's going to tell you he's a Calvinist because of the Bible. Um, but I think there are some strong biblical reasons to affirm the Calvinist uh, slash compatibilist view of free will. Um, and so some of those, so not all of them are individually uh, knock down argument in favor of determinism or compatibilism, right? So there's going to be some alternate uh, interpretations. Uh, there's going to be some different models that fare better or worse at interpreting certain texts. But the, in the big strokes, the, the ones that count, minimally count in favor of the Calvinist view, in my opinion, um, are the, the following. So you have lots of texts in the Bible that uh, I think Tom Schreiner has called the spectrum texts that seem to affirm that God is fully in control and brings about in some very strong sense um, all of the things that happen in this world 
from the good to the bad. So including the good and the bad, that God is fully in control of all of those things. Uh, things like the Old Testament declaring you know, God in God says, I am the Lord and there's no other beside me. There's no God. I form light and I create darkness. Uh, I, I um, make well-being and I create calamity. Uh, so there's the spectrum of the good and the bad. And God says, I am the Lord who does all these things in Isaiah 45. Um, he says, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal in Deuteronomy. Um the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up in 1 Samuel. So those spectrum texts seem to really say God is the one doing all of those things, the good and the bad. So obviously it raises interesting theological questions about God controlling the bad, but it seems to be the, the reading like that. Uh, a rhetorical question in Amos, does disaster come to a, to a city unless the Lord has done it? Um, and then there's uh, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come in lamentation? So those kinds of texts have, seem to have a strong declaration that all that happens, the good and the bad, it's God making it happen. Uh, and um, then there's various classic texts that theologians on the Calvinist side intend to bring up where we have God claiming to have done something, even though the telling of that event is very clear that it's the free choices and actions of human beings. Uh, so you have the Genesis 50 passage where God sends Joseph into Egypt, into slavery. And then Joseph declares, well, it's not, it's not. So he tells his brothers, we sent him into slavery, into Egypt and tells them, you didn't do this. God sent me. Uh, and what you meant for evil, God intended for good, uh, that many people would be safe. So classic texts uh, that the Calvinists have uh, used to show that God is the one doing those things that are said to be also done freely by human beings. Similar uh, patterns in Isaiah 10, where God is sending the Assyrians in judgment against Israel. And uh, he's saying it, th that they are the rod of his anger. Uh, and yet he turns around and then judges uh, the Assyrians for doing something wrong. So we have a fairly nice picture of God controlling something that's said to be bad and that it doesn't exclude the moral responsibility of those who did it because he turns around and judges them for what they've done. Uh, and then the, the classic text in uh, Acts chapter 4 talking about the crucifixion of Jesus where we understand that this was an act done by human beings, uh, the murder of Jesus, the judicial murder. Uh, and yet God is saying that this happened according to his uh, plan as a de determined predestination uh, of that plan for obviously the good purpose that uh, we know very well to have the uh, redemption of sinners through that, uh, that event where the, the text in Acts chapter 4 says that Herod, Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel did whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So those kinds of texts, classic, uh, affirm that God is the one doing stuff and that yet uh, human beings are morally responsible for it. Um, other elements, again, uh, briefly on the Bible, there's obviously all the stream of teachings around election and predestination. So very fertile for debate and conversation uh, uh, from different points of view. But the uh, surface reading of the text seems to suggest that God is the one who elects people onto salvation, uh, that we are said to be foreordained for salvation, that we've been chosen before the foundation of the world. We've been predestined uh, to be elect. So this stream of biblical teaching uh, helps the Calvinist case in my uh, estimation. And then there's a couple of philosophical arguments um, that still have biblical premises because everything Calvinist apparently has to be connected to the Bible. Um, so there's two arguments that I've uh, uh, discussed in my work and that I have uh, um, tried to articulate in a philosophically rigorous way, but have a long tradition of uh, being pressed by the reformed side of uh, the debate. Uh, one is an argument based on original sin that was uh, championed by Martin Luther. And another one um, on the praiseworthiness of God uh, that was, all, well, I think Luther also articulated this one, but it's mostly clear uh, in Jonathan Edwards. So um, the argument from Luther is to say original sin means that we cannot live a fully sinless life. So we're unable to live a, a perfectly sinless life. And yet we are responsible for uh, living, like we are, we are required 
to live a perfectly sinless life, and we're held accountable when we fail to do that. So the, those two together uh, militate for the view that we don't have the ability, the categorical ability to avoid something for which yet we are blamed. Uh, so that's an argument that uh, when you unpack it uh, all the way, uh, leads to a compatibilist uh, view of uh, human free will. And uh, then there's the, the a, a similar argument from Jonathan Edwards um, that is considering the free will of God and saying that God is unable to sin, he's incapable of uh, acting wrongly, of doing something wrong, and yet he's praiseworthy for his goodness, his righteousness, and he's, uh, uh, he's acting well. So it would seem that, the, um, that you don't need the categorical ability to do otherwise in order to be morally responsible. So that's one, again, lots of things to say around that, but that's a sketch of the argument um, that would give you a compatibilist conclusion if you affirm both divine impeccability uh, and uh, divine praiseworthiness. And one way of removing some of the debates or simplifying them would be to apply that to the person of Jesus. Uh, if you take Jesus to be impeccable and praiseworthy, this might be a closer um, uh, situation to ours uh, to explain why uh, free will behaves like that. But there's a good case to be made on the basis of Christ that uh, free will is compatible like that, that you don't need the categorical ability to do otherwise in order to be morally responsible. So you have all of these biblical texts, the teachings on election, predestination, Luther on original sin, Jonathan Edwards on divine praiseworthiness. Um, there's a number of other arguments in favor of compatibilism, um, not all of which I endorse. Uh, so it might be worth mentioning. Um, some people use divine foreknowledge as an argument in favor of uh, Calvinism uh, because they say that divine uh, foreknowledge is incompatible with uh, indeterminism that if we have a libertarian type of free will, that God would not be in a position to foreknow the outcome of our free choices. And then, so if you think that God does foreknow the outcome of our free choices, then that's a reason to deny, to affirm determinism, to deny libertarian free will. Now, I don't use this argument myself because I'm not convinced that I can show that libertarian free will and divine foreknowledge are incompatible. Um, some others have tried. I think that uh, Taylor Sear is one proponent of that view. Um, and, you know, God bless him. That, that helps my case uh, if he is successful. But I, I don't feel confident that I can defend that view. So I don't use that argument. But it's definitely one that's out there. Uh, and then I suppose another uh, argument could be also used um, based on uh, the grounding objection. So if you think that uh, counterfactuals, no, now we're no, no longer talking about future contention, but if you think that counterfactuals are true, that, that there is such a thing that we would freely do in a hypothetical set of circumstances, and you also think that Molinism doesn't work because of maybe the grounding objection or some other argument against uh, Molinism that I think Philip Swenson has a, a decent uh, case in your show uh, against the coherence of Molinism. So if you think any of those work um, and you think that God knows uh, counterfactuals of, of free will, then that's together an argument in favor of the determinist view, I suppose. Now, again, I don't feel very competent to defend the grounding objection or co consistency uh, type arguments against Molinism, but I suppose that's one route that the philosopher could take. There's yet other cases in the literature that are discussed. Uh, you might be familiar with the so-called Frankfurt style cases. Uh, they are arguments that have been taken to support compatibilism. Um, and they're very interesting uh, uh, sets of arguments to get into. I don't, uh, I don't use them myself as an argument in favor of compatibilism because I think that there are pretty decent responses from the incompatibilist side um, that I can't overcome. So I don't use those arguments in my own work, but other compatibilists, uh, very competent compatibilists have used them and uh, I'll let them defend their case there. So that gives you a pretty fast tour of the arguments that I take to be in favor of the compatibilist view of free will, they certainly educate um, why I uh, interpret divine providence along those lines. Okay, so I was trying to jot down a list as you ran through them. So you gave biblical arguments, mm -hmm. mainly by citing kind of uh, Calvinist, different different texts that are used in support of Calvinism. Yeah. Then you gave theological arguments, from what I can tell, two of them. One was based on original sin, 
and then one was based on God's free will. Yep. Um, God doesn't seem to have alternative possibilities, mm-hmm. uh, at least not with respect to like these kinds of moral. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But yet he's free. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the so those were two that you very much seem to affirm. You listed three more, the divine foreknowledge one, but you don't seem to go that route. Or, yeah, you don't feel comfortable defending that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned arguments against Molinism. Uh, and then you mentioned the Frankfurt, Frankfurt style, case. style cases. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm understanding you when you say the arguments against Molinism. So, like Philip Swenson, for example, he's a libertarian. But right. he offers arguments against Molinism. Yes. So that argument, like arguments against Molinism, would serve in like an argument from elimination to compatibilism. Uh, so, 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 what... the, so the route there would be like, let's say you were from, let's not take Philip Swenson's argument because it can get messy because at some point he does use premises that I would not use myself. So it's not like I can use his arguments wholesale and then say, that's it. I'm on board with the conclusions. Uh, I, I, there are some premises that are not affirmable by a compatibilist. But let's take the, uh, the stock uh, um, grounding objection. Okay. So the grounding objection is simply an argument that tries to show that uh, libertarian free will um, is incompatible with God's knowledge of counterfactuals. And right? so the, God's knowledge of counterfactuals, which is one of those pillars of Molinism, um, is the, uh, the, simply the affirmation that God knows what we would freely do in any set of circumstances that he might place us in. So will you aside from whether we are in fact placed in those circumstances, he knows what we would do if he were to put us in those circumstances. So if the grounding objection is something that you can defend, then you have established the incompatibility between um, indeterminism and the truth of counterfactuals, right? So from there, if what you need in order to establish determinism is simply the truth of counterfactuals. If you are convinced that there are true counterfactuals and the grounding objection tells you that they're not compatible with indeterminism, then it follows that determinism is true. I see. Okay. Gotcha. That was clear. But you don't you don't go that route because you don't want to defend the I'm grounding not a objection. competent enough defender of the grounding objection. There are some pretty formidable uh, thinkers on the defensive side, and I don't have the uh, firepower to, to sustain that. But if others do it well, then I'll use their conclusion and then say, look, I think we have counterfactuals of freedom. I think there are some true things about what we would do. Um, and I think that even Philip Swenson um, affirmed this much. He says it really seems like we do. Now, he kind of has to interpret them differently. But at face value, it really seems like there are some things about what we would freely do uh, in some hypothetical circumstances. And I think that there's also biblical affirmations of at least a handful of those, um, the, the counterfactuals that you can find them in the scriptures. Um, but obviously, they're not an argument for Molinism in themselves when you find counterfactuals in the Bible. You need counterfactuals and indeterminism or libertarianism uh, in order to have Molinism. So what I'm saying is that if those reasons to affirm counterfactuals convince you like they do me that there are true counterfactuals, and also you have a good argument against the coherence of uh, Molinism in as much as counterfactuals are incompatible with libertarian free will, then that's an argument against libertarian free will. Gotcha. Okay. That's helpful. All right. So those were your arguments to think that uh, this view compatibilism is true. Now, um, let's look at some objections. So, what Where are are, <laughs> what are some objections to compatibilism uh, in the literature? And and you can offer responses as you go through these objections. Yeah. So there's lots of them. Um, maybe it's a, an appropriate time to shamefully play, uh, plug my book because I do try to go at the most important ones in there. So my book is Excusing Sinners and Blaming God. Um, and what the title suggests is that there's actually two very important families of arguments um, uh, that are used against the determinist compatibilist view. Um, the, all the arguments about excusing sinners are going to be arguments in favor of incompatibilism. 
right? So the arguments that say that if God determines what we do, then he cannot uh, praise or blame us for our choices. And then there's also a second family of arguments that say, uh, if God determines what we do, then that includes the evil that we do and that inappropriately involves him in evil. Uh, so that would mean that he's somehow the author of sin or that he's is 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 tainted by our sin in one way or another. Um, and so there's, again, a number of ways of unpacking the claim, but that's basically a big family of arguments there. So um, I, I try to tackle most of the arguments in those two families in my book to respond for why determinism does not, in fact, excuse sinners, nor does it blame God. Um, and so we, we can start with some of the objections against uh, compatibilism, per se. So in, uh, the claim that um, if determinism is true, then God should not be able to praise or blame uh, what we do. Um, so here to establish incompatibilism, um, so well, an argument against uh, determinism and compatibilism, there's a, a family of arguments uh, that are all proceeding by analogy, where they're going to say, um, Here's a situation in which we are all agreeing, or at least we should all agree, that somebody is excused, like he's not morally responsible. And then I'm going to say that there's something about God determining us that's a bit like that. And that's going to lead us to think that God determining us should also exclude moral responsibility. And so there's a number of different cases that can be provided like this. Uh, and to try to do the slide from the uncontroversial case towards the regular compatibilist case to say if this case is not morally responsible then neither should us being determined by god be morally responsible and the various cases are i mean i try to catalog them and respond to them individually in my book so there's there's claims that we're a little bit like pets or puppets right that sometimes there's metaphors around that robots that we are somehow uh, no, mo no more morally responsible than the pets in the hands of the puppeteer or that we are pets or, um, yeah, or robots. Uh, then there's a coercion arguments. So here again, coercion is a situation in which most likely we would uh, all agree that somebody can be excused if they are forced to do something against their will, right? They are under the coercion. Um, then we would probably, or, I mean, again, pro all, and you never have everybody on board, but uh, it's, it's one where we have a strong intuition that the person should be excused, that they're not morally responsible. And um, then we can say, okay, well, then if we are just determined by God, there's something very much like that. We, we should be able to transfer that uh, intuition onto the normal case for um, where uh, human beings are determined by God. So, Pets and puppets and, and, uh, and robots, coercion. Then there's the manipulation argument. So this is the one that you probably got uh, an earful of uh, when you interviewed Dr. Periboom. Uh, that's the, the claim that when you have somebody who's manipulated, um, so here again, how you craft that manipulation can vary from one uh, uh, proponent to another, but uh, things like um, you know, electrodes in your brain by a mad scientist, so typically a case of very strong manipulation like that, or even milder cases of manipulation could, um, could place you in a situation where we have the strong intuition that you are not morally responsible. And then we uh, do the slide again uh, towards the normal case uh, of compatibilism where you would say, well, you shouldn't be morally responsible there either because it's very much like the case of manipulation. And then there's another uh, argument by an analogy like that that's based on uh, mental illness. So there's some in the literature who also say that some people who have a mental illness that should excuse them for something that uh, they've done, um, that that also should be uh, analogous to uh, the normal case on compatibilism. On determinism. So all of those have the same structure, really, but they are different conditions. And so they are, they are going to admit different responses from the compatibilist. And here again, there's a lot to say about arguments by analogy. Um, in my work, I've actually tried to break down the structure of the argument so that we're clear on what is being claimed. Um, and Again, I don't know that we can succinctly uh, go into I, all of the details of how you respond to an argument by analogy. If your uh, listeners and viewers are interested to go deep into those arguments, 
I would point them to an episode of uh, Parker's Pensies, uh, the podcast by Parker Sedekes. Um, he had me on to discuss just that, the, the arguments by analogy and very particularly the manipulation argument. And so we go into great length there. So if you want the full story, that's a, a long episode to listen to. Um, but here I can just probably brush some of the initial responses to, uh, to, the, uh, to these arguments with the manipulation argument particularly. So you tell me how much you need on those. Uh, and we can yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think if, it's a, if we have time, I hear the robots thing come up all the time. So I think if if you don't mind, I would like to address that. I, I think for a lot of people, that'll be like the common sense objection. Like, well, then we're just robots. So um, and then the, the manipulation, we can't go into the detail, but if you can just kind of sketch uh, uh, the, the, the response. So okay. that'll probably be all the time we have for for those types of objections of application. okay so that sounds good to me the robot objection by uh, accepting your challenge i'm going to be accused of taking the low-hanging fruit so that's fine with me uh, i want to take it but i take the robot and pets and puppets to be far the weaker of all of those conditions that i've used and i take the manipulation one to be the strongest so we, we can uh, do the bookends uh, the easiest and the, the most difficult and if i tackle a little bit of both uh, i won't be accused of taking the easy ones yeah um so but the, the answer actually for both of those has the same structure like i said they're arguments by analogy so the way that you respond to them is by unpacking a little bit what's the claim here right here again, we're talking, like just phrase the, the, the dialectic correctly. It's an argument in favor of incompatibilism. So it's, an, it's a positive argument to establish that determinism and moral responsibility are not compatible with each other. And so it's an argument for which the burden of proof is on the shoulders of the incompatibilist at this point. And so if you take the argument from Luther and from um, uh, Edwards that I mentioned earlier, that's where the burden of proof is fully on the Calvinist. And he's trying to explain and demonstrate that compatibilism is true. But now for the uh, manipulation and the uh, robots argument, uh, we are fully on the side of having the burden of proof for the incompatibilist. So what do they need to convince us uh, that, determine, that incompatibilism is true? Uh, what they do is they use the analogous case, and then they make one of two claims. They must either claim that the situation in which we agree we are not morally responsible, they, they, must, they must say that situation, either it's, it has a similar, it's, it has a relevant similarity with the normal case, or a stronger claim is there, there is no relevant difference between the two. And so either of those, if they can demonstrate that, that's successfully showing that we shouldn't be morally responsible uh, if determinism is true. But there are two different routes. Uh, so I've called them there's the mild argument from analogy and the bold uh, argument from analogy. So the mild version is the one that simply says there's a similar, uh, there's a relevant similarity. So the, the, the normal case of compatibilism determinism is relevantly analogous is relevantly similar to that condition. So now we're talking about either the robots or the manipulation or the coercion or whatever. So that's an existential claim to say there is a relevant similarity. And what is a relevant similarity? A relevant similarity in our case here, it's going to be a property of the case where we're not morally responsible, right? So, so a property of the robot or of the manipulation case that excludes moral responsibility in that case and is also present in the normal case of a determined human being, right? So you can see that if we have one of those, then it follows that we should not be morally responsible uh, on determinism. If there's a property of that case that explains that it that removes moral responsibility and we also find it in the other, then that would remove it in the other case. Um, the difficulty in shouldering that burden of proof is that we're rarely told what is that similar um, property. What is it that is present in this one that entails that we are not morally responsible and that is also present in the other? Um, one natural candidate, usually when we compare those two cases, is going to be to say something like, well, we don't have the ability to do otherwise. You know, like he doesn't have it, we don't have it. Um, but very so depending on how you phrase that that's uh, alleged similarity 
you're going to very quickly find yourself in question begging premises because you're going to say, well, the thing that was removing it is something that actually is determinism. Well, if it's determinism to begin with, then you know we haven't made much progress by using the analogous case. All you have is the presupposition that determinism does the trick, that it removes moral responsibility. But whether determinism removes moral responsibility is the very question that we're disagreeing on. So that mild version of the argument by analogy is pretty hard to do. Uh, and typically what you find is a, a turn to the bolder claim, which is to say, there are no relevant differences, right? So now this is no longer saying there's a property in my case, example case, and I'm gonna trace it to the other one. It's going to say, look, there's gotta be something in my case where we all agree there's no more responsibility. And um, you can't find something that's different in your uh, determinist case that would mean that now it's okay for us to be morally responsible. So he's saying, uh, there's no difference, there's no relevant difference that you can point to, okay? So if that's true, once again, I think the argument is successful because if there is no relevant difference, then we should be excused in both cases. Now, the difficulty is how are you going to sustain that uh, objection to say uh, like there is no relevant difference? It's a negative existential claim, right? So you're saying that like, none of the properties uh, that are different are relevant. Um, it's going to be hard to convince me of that, to, to run down all the properties of your case and of the determinist normal case and to tell me none of them are relevant and to convince me that they are not relevant, all right? So in facing that, that bolder version of the argument by analogy, the compatibilist has two responses to make. The first one is to still say that it's, it is still question begging, right? Because technically, I haven't been pushed to accept that there are no relevant differences. And I'm, I'm waiting for you to convince me that there are no relevant differences. But beyond mere skepticism like this, to say simply, you know, you have the burden of proof and I have not been convinced. Now on the um, uh, bolder claim, you actually have the opportunity as a Calvinist to go on the offensive and not just leave the matter as a um, uh, question of burden of proof and to say it, you've not been proven, uh, you've not proven it, you, uh, you are begging the question. Now you can go even on the offensive and say, no, I'm going to prove that your premise is false, that there is in fact a relevant difference. So if you can do that, then you've done more than just saying the argument is question begging, even though I think the argument is question begging, but you can also show, yeah, but no, actually I refute it. So to refute it, you could provide a property that's a relevant difference. So now here again, what is a relevant difference in our case? That's going to be a property of um, the case that we're, we, we agree excuse moral responsibility. So in, in, a property of the example um, that exclude moral responsibility, but is not present in the normal case of determinism. That would be a relevant difference, right? If you identify something that excludes moral responsibility in the example case, in the analogous case, and you show that, that it, it does exclude moral responsibility, but it's not present in the normal case of determinism, then that's it, you have a relevant difference and if there is a relevant difference, then it's refuting the claim that there are no relevant differences. Okay, so now it's the big question in each of those cases, can the Calvinist identify that relevant difference, right? Uh, and so in each of those, in my work, I try to offer something that I think is quite convincingly the relevant difference, while having preceded all of that by saying, look, I don't even have to do this technically. <laughs> I, you know, I could just tell you your argument is question begging, but I'm going to go ahead, stick my neck out and offer to you some candidates that I think are relevant differences, which would go beyond uh, just mere skepticism and refute the argument, the, the bold argument by analogy. So in the case of the robot, this is why I was saying it's kind of the, the weakest, uh, the, the low hanging fruit. Uh, it's trivially easy to find a property of the robot that excludes moral responsibility, but is not present in the normal case of uh, a determined human being. And here it's simply the fact that the robot does not have self-consciousness, right? So uncontroversially, the robot is not self-conscious, right? Uncontroversially, if you're not self-conscious, you cannot be morally responsible. So we all agree on that. And uncontroversially, human beings are self-conscious. 
So we have all those three ingredients that I said are uh, the, 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 the signature of a relevant difference. None of them are controversial. And so that refutes the argument that the, 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 re, the Calvinist is very consistent, is able to consistently say, look, robots are not morally responsible and we are. And there's a very good reason for that is because they're not self-conscious. So they can't be morally responsible. Stop bothering me with your robots claim. <laughs> okay. So that, that's for the low hanging fruits. Now I did mention others. Maybe I can just briefly give you my candidate for a relevant difference. You have the coercion argument. So here again, you know, lots of things to say, but I think at bottom, what I offer as the refuting uh, relevant difference is the fact that coercion um, in the uh, analogous case uh, entails the presence of physical force or threats. Um, so again, there's discussion about what coercion actually is. There's controversies about definitions and all of that I go into my book. But at bottom, I think that you need physical force or threats to count as coercion. And I think that that is the relevant difference because physical force or threats uncontroversially are present in the case of coercion. They remove moral responsibility and they are not present in the normal case where I do something freely allegedly determined by God. So we have a nice uh, refu refuting defeater here for the coercion case. And now we come to the, uh, the, the most difficult one, which is the manipulation case. So uh, for the manipulation case, what I've suggested in my work, and once again, I'm just, it's just me sticking my neck out because I technically don't have to, but I think very much something like this is true. I think that in order to be morally responsible for what you do, the choice to do it needs to flow out of your God-given character and desires. Something like that must be true. And I think it's not all that controversial either because it's a libertarian is perfectly welcome to affirm something like that. And an easy way to see that is to say, imagine that you, your, your choice is not flowing from your God-given character and desires. It seems like it's clearly being interfered with by something else that the incompatibilist is going to be inclined to say is removing your moral responsibility. So uh, that condition, that that uh, uh, that condition of making a choice according to your God-given character and desires, I think is uncontroversially present. Um, so so is it's it's satisfied by the normal case on determinism, right? Because on determinism, I'm still freely choosing to do what I want. It's a choice that flows out of my God-given character and desires. But that is not satisfied by the strong manipulation case with uh, maybe a, a mad scientist with electrodes in your forehead um, because he is tampering with your God-given character and desire. Right? So there's a, a condition that is, we, we can see on the manipulation case, you, your choice is not flowing out of your God-given character and desire. I think we all agree that this excludes your moral responsibility. And I think we agree it's not the case in the normal uh, determinist case. So it seems to me like we have a successful relevant difference between those two. Now, there's obviously some rejoinders. People can find issue with my Kaga characterization. Um, some people might also say, well, no, if you do, um, so you might. Uh, yeah, so th that might be an arbitrary uh, distinction, right? To say, well, just because God is doing it, what's the difference with the mad scientist? Um, so th there's a bit more to be said, but I think that's a very solid candidate for what the incompatibilist is asking with the manipulation argument, which is, is there a relevant difference? I think that's the one. And, and to defend slightly against the charge of arbitrariness, I would say that, yes, uh, it can strike us as a little bit arbitrary to say, well, you know, when the mad scientist is doing it on my brain, somehow it removes my moral responsibility, but it's, it's just fine when it's God who controls my very thoughts and, and my inner makeup. And here, what I would say is um, to try to diffuse a little bit the uh, intuition is to say that the distinction between human beings, like, uh, uh, like a mad scientist or, or some any any sort of other human agent who would be removing your moral responsibility when tampering with your God-given desires, um, is is massively different. There's a huge gap between human beings like that and the creator of the universe, who's the proper creator and maker of my own uh, self. And so um, we can appreciate that there are lots of things that when we do them. Uh, it counts as something. And if God were to do it, it would be completely different. One example would be to take a life, for example. 
right? Uh, so I'm if if uh, if I kill my wife, uh, that's a murder uh, and it's wrong. Um, if my wife's mom kills my wife, that's still wrong. That's still murder. Uh, if um, if my children kill my wife, that's still wrong. So no matter who does it, it seems like it's it's murder. But if God takes her life today, we as Christians would be committed to saying, no, this is fine. He's the author of life. He's the one who's created her, and he's it's his prerogative to do that. So there are creature cre cre creator creature distinctions. Go pronounce this with a French accent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that there are, these distinctions, I think. Um, uh, help us appreciate why it's so different when God is the one who's providentially controlling everything about me and is in providential control of the outcome of my choices in a way that preserves my moral responsibility because he has he has proper appropriate access to my state of heart, my state of mind, and he has the liberty to change them how he pleases, as opposed to a human being who is now tempering with your God-given character and desires in such a way that your choice that's expressed is really not a reflection of your God-given character and desires, but a tempering of, of it by somebody else and therefore removes your um, blameworthiness or praiseworthiness. Okay. So obviously a lot was said there. I can't summarize it all. I'll give the structure though. We're looking at objections to compatibilism. You said there's basically two families of objections. There's the ones that try to excuse us say well we're not morally responsible if uh compatibilism or if this view is is uh true yes, uh, or true. yeah if we're determined yep. if we're not morally responsible if we're determined yep. um and then the other family is saying that well somehow god is actually um in the wrong here or or yeah he's done something morally wrong if if he holds us accountable and we're determined or yeah. if we, yeah. if he holds us to be yeah. morally responsible and we're determined. Okay. So we didn't, ha we haven't discussed anything in that family yet. The, yes, the blaming right. God, we've only stuck with the ones yeah. that say if determinism is true, then we're not morally responsible. Um, so you gave arguments from analogy. There was the robot talk, uh, uh, coercion, manipulation, we didn't talk about mental illness, but mm -hmm. uh, that does come up in the Perry Boom interview that I did. Oh, I so, did okay. um, and yeah, you laid out the dialectic really well there that as an argument from analogy, the conclusion of this argument must be that um, incompatibilism is true. That's what mm -hmm. the person's trying to argue for. That's got to mm -hmm. be the conclusion of the argument. So the burden's on that person to make the case and um, they can try to go about that in those two ways you said, either saying um, there is a uh, there is no relevant difference. That's the strong claim. Yes. Or the weaker oh. claim of um, there are differences, but there aren't these aren't relevant. The, the, the key is there's this there's this similarity, the similar property that um, they're in both. And that's the one that's that property is the one that excuses us or makes us not morally responsible mm -hmm. um yeah and so you you did out that whole thing really well <laughs> you we're, got at it 50, all. we're at the 53 minute mark um are would you want to maybe give just one type of the blaming god objection okay yeah so uh, Maybe it's, it's not so much one type, it's kind of a classification of those objections. And it's going to be a bit of a bold claim on my, on my side to say, here is why they all fail in the same ways. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, but then for the details, you can, again, uh, consult my uh, detailed work in, in the book. Um, so I think that's the, the, the accusation here is to say that God is doing something inappropriate when he determines us to do something evil. Um, you have... I, I tend to put them in three categories. Uh, like I, I say that the argument tends to be half-baked, and I say that there's really three recipes to try to complete the baking. Um, one of them is the foggy recipe, and then there's the ambitious, and then there's the timid. So the foggy recipe is simply to try to use the language about God being the author of sin, uh, to say that if God determines what we do and that includes our sin, then he's the author of sin, and that's wrong. 
Um, and the response to this uh, foggy version is to say that we're not even sure which premise to refute here uh, because it's not altogether clear what is meant by author of sin. Um, are we saying that something that God is uh, inappropriately like, the author of sin, like he's, he's, he's doing something wrong, that he's evil himself or that he's sinning himself? Um, if that's what we mean by the phrase author of sin, then the Calvinist is going to say, well, look, I deny that God is the author of sin in that sense. Uh, and I don't see how that follows from determinism simply like that. Um, so that 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 doesn't really uh, successfully refute uh, the compatibilist view. On the other hand, if what uh, is meant by author of sin is something uh, a little bit milder, like uh, God is determining what we do, then that's question begging. Right? So if just because he's determining, then it's evil. Uh, that's the very debated question. So the, when you clarify the foggy, you end up either begging the question or, um, or also making claims that um, might be self-refuting with the objector's own view. Right? So if you, if you don't say, okay, it's the determinism, but it's something else, like in what way is God standing behind evil? Um, the ob objector might make claims that uh, it's wrong for God to do X, not realizing that his own model of God actually entails that God does that very thing. Because it's no longer determinism, right? So the fact that he rejects determinism doesn't keep him safe from his own objection. And they tend to make claims that might well be attacking their own view as well. So when you unpack the foggy recipe, you land with self-refuting or uh, question begging, which is not a great fate on either end. Uh, and then um, that's when you try to clarify what it is, I think that's that's really those, the, the ambitious and the timid. So the, the ambitious says God does not stand in evil, in be, st does not stand behind evil in any way, right? And that's too ambitious. And that's what's self-refuting because in some way or another, God stands behind evil, right? I mean, if you're a Christian and you affirm the various texts that I've read at the beginning of this interview, God is behind evil in those in one way, at least, even if not in a determinist way. So you can't flat out say he doesn't stand behind evil in any way. That would be too ambitious. And that ends up being self-refuting. On the other hand, the timid recipe, which says, okay, it's not that he uh, doesn't stand behind evil in any way, but he doesn't stand behind evil in a deterministic way. That's your problem. That's your view's problem. But that view, that claim now becomes question begging because again, the, the simple fact of determinism is not granted to entail that God is doing something wrong. That's the debated question at hand. So if you, if you clarify in what way God stands behind evil, you tend to fall on each of, of those sides. Either you are self-refuting because you're affirming something um, that your own model of God entails, and so you shouldn't say it's wrong for God to do that, or you're simply focusing on what's in, indeed unique about my Calvinist view, but then it's question begging whether that, in fact, is a, is a problem. So that's the, the, the big lines of my responses to those type of arguments, but there's lots of details about how one articulates each attempt and whether they fall in one camp or the other. All right. Very good. So let's, we're about to come up on the hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and shift to this last question, which is say you're right. Okay. You've, you've told us what compatibilism is. You've told us why you believe it and why you think objections to it fail. So say you're right. What are the implications of compatibilism for Christian theology? Yes. Um, so there's probably more than I can think of or list, uh, but I think there's there's two big ones that um, are nothing new to my work. Right. So it's not me coming up with those. I think they are fairly classic unpackings of benefits of the uh, Calvinist view uh, for the for Christian theology. Um, I mean, I guess I phrased it in positive ways. You are just you just ask about implications. Maybe they don't have to be great, uh, but I think that they are. They happen to be good. Um, the first one is is the question of whether there's any purpose in all evil. Um, so when we think of uh, all of evil being determined by God, um, it has initially raised lots of philosophical questions about whether that imply that implicates in a God in evil in a in a inappropriate way, once we've shielded those objections philosophically, it comes with a payoff, which is that 
as God is determining everything that happens, including all of the evil that happens, that's all of our suffering, everything that's going wrong with this world, um, we're in a position to say that there is a redeem redemptive purpose. That is that God has a sufficient reason for all of that that happens to us. And it's not a general good reason, right? Because, I mean, I think every Christian should affirm that God has good reasons for allowing evil. But the Calvinist is in a position to say there's specific goods for every instance of suffering and evil that happens in this world. Now, in a dialectical with an atheist, the non-Calvinist Christians tend to think of this as a weakness because they're going to say, well, now you're committed to saying there's got to be a specific purpose behind every little evil thing that happens to us. And God knows there's a lot of that. So it can be seen as a weakness there. And that's fine. And we need to discuss the problem of evil with the atheists and the Calvinist must be engaged in that debate. And great. OK, we'll, we'll do that. But the flip side, the, the implication for a Christian view is that now it's a benefit because it gives you meaning in your own suffering in every case. That is that every instance of pain and suffering that you have can be read as something that is not pleasant, is not good, that we should not call it good right? It's if it's evil, because yeah, not all suffering is evil. right? So, but there, there can be moral evil suffering caused by that. And you should call that evil and regret the suffering, but you can find some important measure of comfort in knowing that this evil has been inflicted uh, in God's larger providence with a view towards a compensating good, that God had a good reason, something that justifies your suffering. And I think pastorally speaking, it brings a great deal of comfort and it's a big help in times of suffering. Um, no, and I can speak personally. I'm not a pastor myself at all. Uh, I'm really <laughs> more the philosopher than the pastor. But uh, I have certainly instances of people who've very be, been very moved uh, to say that they've suffered greatly, but that they've appreciated that there was that God, even if we don't know what He's up to, that there is a reason why He's uh, bringing this about, and that we can rejoice in at least glorifying God in suffering well in those things that God has orchestrated for us. Um, so I think that's that's a very practical implication of the com compatibilist Calvinist view on of Christian th theology. That suffering so, has a redemptive purpose. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and healthy. again, once once again, you have to contrast it with the alternative, which is to say that uh, if free will is libertarian, that there are instances of evil that are, are happening purely because uh, libertarian free will went the wrong way. Right? That it's not that, that God has a uh, general redemptive purpose of behind this evil that he permits. Now, again, how you phrase that on the libertarian side is going to depend on whether you're an open theist, a classical Arminian, or a Mormonist. Right? They're going to have different phrases of how God just has reasons and therefore allows this evil that happens through the agency of free will. But in all cases, there is something that is permitted by God even though it's evil, not for any specific good that comes out of that. So God does not intend it to happen, but it's simply a byproduct of a free choice being libertarian and therefore not such that God could have determined him to be otherwise for a very specific purpose. So that free will is ultimately a, the full explanation for why certain evils are permitted by God, which is not the case on Calvinism. And so you can see how that actually can cheapen a little bit your confidence in good, um, in suffering, because, I mean, take a, a terrible case, right? A rapist is, uh, is raping somebody. Um, there's a strong difference in assessing, okay, it's a horrible thing that happens, but God somehow has some redemptive good purposes behind this, some morally justifying reason for why this specifically happened. And, it's not purely to preserve the free will of the rapist, right? Because th that would be the alternative. You, you still want to ask, so God, on no, on, no matter which model, even the incompatibilist models, God has um, the, is sovereign. He is able to prevent some things. Uh, you, if, if he can't make the, free, the rapist freely refrain, he could just strike him dead or he could just interfere with his actions, just make it just not work out. And yet he doesn't. Uh, so, but, but the, the question is like, what is God after here in allowing this? 
is this really just the unbridled, unbridled expression of the rapist free will? Or does he have a deeper purpose behind this? And on the Calvinist view, no matter how horrible things are happening to you, you can trust that there is a specific purpose that God has behind. And it, sh it, is, the, it, it is a great comfort in the suffering to say, God is in this and it's serving him and it's glorifying him in spite of the horrible suffering. And it's not that he allowed it just to preserve the free will of the offender. Okay. Um, did you want to mention that was, that was one of the implications? Did, yeah, did you I, I have another that's one that's that you wanted to mention before we do Q and a? Yeah. Another one that's uh, traditionally highlighted uh, is the, the good grounds that this gives you for humility, for your own goodness and for your salvation ultimately. So this is something that Calvinists have been quite open about uh, highlighting to say the reason why I'm saved, the reason why I'm a Christian um, has nothing to do with my own goodness. It's not because I was smarter than my neighbor who is still a non-believer. It's not because I was more spiritually attuned. Somehow this is not a quality about me. We are all fallen sinners of Adam and God's strong providential control of who exactly comes to saving faith is a good grounds to say, look, this is just God's doing. It's not my own doing, not my own goodness. God is the one who grabs me by the throat and makes me a Christian. Uh, and I should therefore not be able to look down on others who are not in that place and to say, yeah, it's God's providential choice. Uh, I have been uh, blessed with this election that was none of my own goodness. And I should just give all the praise to God and not look down on those that have not been so chosen. So obviously, once again, it raises the theological question. Well, is it okay for God to not choose everybody? If he's the one who makes that choice, is this arbitrary? Is this wrong for God to elect uh, in the way that Calvinists say the Bible says that he does? Um, and you want to discuss those. But I think in terms of practical implication, it's a pretty decent ground for humility to say, look, I'm not better. Right? And this is something I personally have experienced in my own coming to Christ. Uh, I was a, an atheist. I grew up in France, was an atheist for much of my young adult life. And I had a fairly radical conversion experience through a set of crazy circumstances that happened to me when I was hostile to God and religion. And just God has intently broken down all of my defenses, changed my heart, uh, washed my mind and made me a Christian. Now, as a result, this type of experience, obviously, I'm not saying oh, this happens to me, therefore Calvinism is true. This is not the kind of inference, but it, it's, it's kind of a, a good test case to say, how, how did I experience my salvation? It certainly doesn't come across as I was smarter, I was more loving God, I was more spiritual than anyone else. It's just that God decided to make me a Christian and he was quite successful at it. All right. Very good. Well, we covered a lot of ground and what's, you know, if, if you've been paying attention <laughs> to the viewers, uh, you'll quickly recognize we only touched the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> this thing could go on and on and on. So hopefully you decide to check out uh, Dr. Bignon's book. It, I haven't read it myself yet, but after doing this interview, I'm like, man, I want to read this book. It sounds like it's just very, I can tell you're very clear in what you're saying. So I, I really appreciate that. Good. Um, can we do maybe like 10 minutes of Q and A? Yes. You're okay. I have five okay. children under the age of eight. I can guarantee you they're all in bed by now. So we're, we're okay. safe. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if you have a question for Dr. Bignon, then just type the word question at the beginning and then write it out. I'll, I've already got one from Zach Raymer that I've seen. So be typing that now while you're doing that. If you enjoy this video, uh, then please consider liking the video, maybe subscribe to the channel. If you want to, uh, if you checked out several other interviews, also, if you value the work that I'm doing and you want to see this channel grow, please consider becoming one of my patrons. Um, that will allow me to, um, your support will allow me to devote more of my time to creating content like this. All right. Let's um, let's start with Zach's question. So, okay, here it is. Uh, Fisher and Raviza, I assume I'm saying that right, suggest we need to take responsibility slash ownership for the sources of our actions. 
Does your view include an ownership condition like theirs? If so, do non-believers take responsibility for their God-given character and desires? Um, yeah, and I'm going to be very disappointing. Uh, I don't necessarily have a view on that. So the yes, Fisher and John Martin Fisher and Mark Revis have a great book on moral responsibility, and they are taking a compatibilist view and giving a model of free will. Um, they tend to try to do the very thing that I shy away from doing, which is to give a sufficient condition for moral responsibility. So this is the this is the the holy grail here that I think is very hard. What I do in my work is mostly defensive here. Um, I try to show that uh, moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. So I try to show that um, that indeterminism is not a necessary condition for moral responsibility. Right. So I deny the necessity of that. Um, but I don't really stick my neck out and say, here is what is sufficient in order to get more um, responsible choices. So there might be a whole list of different conditions. Um, so all I claim is that determinism, uh, indeterminism is not necessary for more responsibility. But what is sufficient for more responsibility is a very difficult question. So one thing here that, that uh, Fisher and Raviza say is that one of those ingredients, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're going to have morally responsible choices, is that we need to take responsibility or ownership for the sources of our actions. Uh, and so I guess th here the concern might be that uh, on my uh, claim that you must have a God-given character and desire that's expressed in the choice, do you uh, take ownership for that right so that god is giving you that character and desire do you claim ownership are you responsible for the way you are like that um in this initial wording i'm inclined to say you don't really you don't have categorical control over this right so you can't avoid the character that god has given you the, the, the desires that he gives you um so you are fully determined in that sense but uh, is there a sense of ownership that would still be compatible with that claim perhaps, and, I, and I'm not sure how I would unpack that. Um, I, I do know that uh, Michael Preciado has uh, worked on trying to, um, let's say, formulate Fisher and Ravis as model in a way that's compatible with Calvinist uh, reform theology uh, in, in his book, A Reformed View of Free Will. So he's, he's very strong on assessing those kinds of criteria that are given by Fisher and Ravisa. I haven't done much work myself on whether I fit them into my model or not. And I take the, the coward's way out of not saying, here's what I think is sufficient for moral responsibility. So I don't have to give you a list. And I just try to play defense, at least on the pieces that I see coming my way on offering responses to arguments for incompatibilism. How's that for an unanswered Zach? You, you can ping me on Facebook and voice your disagreement after that. Very good. Okay, let's go to Matt Flummer's question. So I don't know if you watch the Free Will Show, but yes, it's, a yes, absolutely. it's a podcast. He and Taylor Sear host it together. So thanks, Matt, for watching. I'm honored that you came. Uh, Matt says, what about cases of benign manipulation that don't undermine responsibility, but do mess with God-given stuff? Yeah, that's a great question, because uh, when we speak of manipulation, I think there's, uh, at least in my work, I distinguish between two things that we commonly call manipulation. Uh, there's what I've called overriding manipulation and then influencing manipulation. So overriding manipulation is the thing that outright bypasses your will, like the electrodes of the mad scientist, the things that really just outright make you do that thing, uh, no matter what predisposition you had. Uh, so the electrodes of the mad scientist, the love potion, the hypnosis, something that just no matter what your God-given character and desire is, this is going to happen. Um, so what do I make of the milder in influencing manipulation? And here what we typically mean by that is um, uh, various practices that are called manipulation uh, that involve maybe misinformation or um, uh, black uh, emotional blackmail. So just deceitful tactics and inappropriate tactics to try to just push your wrong button to manipulate you into doing something. So what do I make of them? So they don't undermine responsibility. I think I agree with that. Um, and this is the position I take in my book that no matter how annoying they are to the person and how they might even influence you uh, to make the wrong choice, I do think that they do preserve 
your God character, God given character and desire. So uh, this is the answer I would give. So they do mess with God given stuff. Um, yeah, I suppose they are meddling with what's happening in this situation, but they are just one external influencing factor that comes your way, right? So it's, it's one that pushes you in the direction of doing something that you would not have done otherwise, maybe. Um, but it still places you in a circumstance where your God-given character and desire expresses itself in response to that pressure point. So I do think that you can maintain that your God-given characters and desires are expressed in that situation and that therefore you are morally responsible despite the presence of that uh, meddler, if you will. And the reason why I do take the view that we are still morally responsible under influencing manipulation uh, is one that was given to me by Daniel Hill. Uh, he's a philosopher at the University of Liverpool in the UK. And Dan Hill told me, just imagine Jesus in that situation and you'll have your answer. Like, I am influenced you know, under influencing manipulation and I'm pushed, so they push my buttons and I end up doing something wrong. Um, would Jesus have done it had he been subjected to the same kinds of influencing manipulation? And I think it's intuitive that an impeccable person like Jesus would not, so that he would have just withstood the influencing manipulation in a better way than I would have. And therefore, I would I would like to say um, no. If if it's if it's if Jesus would have not uh, uh, sinned in that circumstance, if he if he had resisted that uh, manipulation, then it's not the case that it removes moral responsibility. There's a moral difference between him and I, and the way I behave in that situation betrays. Yes, it's unfortunate that I wouldn't have seen. So it, it's kind of a there's there's luck here involved, right? So because my same character, if I had been left alone by that influencer, uh, would have led me to not see him. But now I'm doing something wrong under the influence. So that's that's tough luck for me. But I think it's still my God-given character and desire, and so I think it's fine to affirm that I'm morally responsible. All right, Justin Henry asked, how would you respond to the claim that we could have done otherwise than live a sinless life, given that we, given that had we died prior to an age of accountability, we wouldn't have committed any sins? Yeah, so that's that's one way of uh, putting the demarcation to say, well, no, you, you could have uh, lived a, a sinless life. Um, so let's see, how do I respond to this? It's, I do respond to this in my book. Um, so what's the crispest way of, of uh, presenting the, the, the answer here? Um, I think that's original. OK, so you're, you're looking at a person who suffers from original inclination, which is that uh, subset of original sin that is the one claimed to secure that we will, in fact, sin, right? So that's the one that's. Uh, is used in my arguments uh, from Martin Luther to say that person, it's impossible for the person to live a fully sinless life. Um, and uh, my brain is fried. So um, the person is born, has original inclination, but uh, dies prior to an age of accountability or even dies very early or even dies prior to birth. Um, so he wouldn't have committed any sins. So now that's that's a life that's impeccable. Um, there's a, a couple of ways to respond to that. One would be to um, qualify um, the yeah qu qualify the oh man I don't know if this is going to be the the most convincing route. Um, um, how do I put this? So if you Original inclination is going to be that condition that secures that you would sin uh, if placed in uh, enough circumstances that uh, you are given an opportunity of sinning, right? So um, the the way out that this scenario seems to take is not one that undermines claims of moral responsibility because it's saying it's, it's a position where the, position, the person is not even put in those circumstances. So they don't have an opportunity to sin or not to sin. And so it's actually not a case of a morally responsible life. Uh, I think that we can restrict the scope of the argument to the portion of people being morally responsible and um, actually um, uh, expressing themselves in morally responsible choices. So um, 
now this uh, restriction of scope would now move the argument to say, well, maybe the very first choice that they make is morally responsible, but then they die right after this. Um, so yes, that's, I guess, logically possible, but it's really not what the scope of the argument is. The argument is take a, a life that is normally lived, that is not prematurely um, uh, interrupted. And here we're going to get into debates or controversies around what does it mean for a life to be prematurely interrupted, right? Because on the Christian view, maybe death at all is premature, is an unnatural unfolding of life. But I think that the, the, the claim of original inclination is to say somebody who lives a normally uh, uh, not interrupted life that has uh, all the, oppor the normal opportunities for sinning is going to be fully unable to, um, to live it without sin. Uh, the other piece that the Reformed theologian has in his uh, back pocket is that original inclination is not the only thing that we count as original sin. There's also original guilt, that there is some, um, so again, this is a controversial theological view, but um, it's not just that we're inclined to do something wrong uh, and that therefore we will do it necessarily if placed in the wrong circumstances. It's also that we bear some um, some moral um, uh, some moral guilt from Adam's sin that's been imputed to us. So uh, if that is also present, then you're not innocent and you're still under condemnation, um, despite the fact that you have not in fact gotten the opportunity of sinning. Um, so if you do affirm a strong view of original sin like that, you're still left with saying that some people, that th those people would still be morally responsible in some sense, but it's a different one. It's one of imputation rather than actual uh, personal responsibility. Um, so I, I don't think that, um, so it, it, it's, it's a corner case here because it's trying to catch the Calvinist's claim, uh, by saying, no, that you don't, you yourself don't believe that, right? So by saying, you know, even on your view, if you die prior to the age of accountability, then we could have, uh, avoided from committing any sins. But the claims of the incompatibilist are much stronger than that mild way out that, uh, Justin is suggesting here. The claim of the incompatibilist is to say that you need the ability to do otherwise in order to be uh, morally uh, blameworthy or praiseworthy. Um, so uh, it's it's the the reason like it needs to be like the reason why you're not sinning needs to be that you've successfully used your free will in all of those, and that's what really you need in order to rescue the principle of alternate possibility. Right, the incompatible the incompatibilist principle of alternate possibility that says you need the ability to do otherwise in order to be morally responsible, is a claim that um, you cannot be blamed unless you have the ability to act better, right? to do something else. But it's not the claim that you have the ability to die instead. Right, <laughs> so uh, that that principle of alternate possibility is the debate here. Is the claim being made by the incompatibilist? And so I don't think that uh, scenarios in which the person just dies are going to help rescuing that principle in light of the claim that you cannot live a sinless life uh, and yet are blameworthy for your failure. All right, a bit slow to catch up on some of the important things that I needed to say about this question, but I think that some of that is in my book developed in the, in the right way. And there, there's another, another way of responding to that same objection that uh, I think was uh, offered to me by Daniel Johnson. Um, and Daniel Johnson simply takes the view that um, because everything we do is tempted by sin, even if you have only one action like in your life, like if, as long as you exist at all, then uh, whatever you have decided to do is, um, is morally guilty and objectionable. So he takes that view. I, I, I don't find it as attractive as my um, view of finding, okay, restrict the scope of the claim. Um, but in any case, I think that it's not a successful way out of the principle of alternate possibilities, according to which you need the ability to do otherwise, not the ability to be struck dead so that you can avoid the sin. All right. I think there were like maybe three more questions, but uh, I'd like to cut this off in the next seven minutes. So we'll just get as many as we can and stop. And maybe so, I'll Tim, a little bit less. I'll try. Tim Saunders uh, asked, "How can an action, how can an action simultaneously be objectively immoral and objectively moral at the same time?" Yeah, I don't think it can. 
uh, but I don't think it's committed to uh, my, that my view is committed to that. So it's objectively, I think maybe in the neighborhood of this claim would be the somewhat counterintuitive uh, uh, issue that an action is said by the Calvinists to be objectively immoral, uh, that, that the person is doing something wrong and that's objectively wrong. Um, and at the same time, it's a good thing that that thing happened, right? Because the Calvinists say, yeah, it was wrong, but God is the one who determined that it would happen because he had a good reason for it. So here simply is the superposition of God's purposes and the human disobedience. So that there can be a good purpose achieved by human disobedience. The disobedience is still objectively immoral. It's still wrong, but it is determined by God to be good. And here, here again, the paradigm case is the brothers of Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Uh, and so the, the two are nicely cohabiting and there's no contradiction between those two. I think that's the best reading I can make of the question. Do you understand it differently, Jordan? Uh, what you said helps me make the most sense. I, I'm not sure what it's asking um, if you don't interpret it the way yeah. you did. Because so, I don't know if the parenthesis mean to to, to um, identify what's just before. So if, if he's saying that free will is objectively immoral and that determinism is objectively moral, but that that's a very strange reading of that. So I don't think that's the case. Yeah, so I, I think, think your I think your interpretation probably. makes the most sense of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this one's a little long. I'm late, but I want to know how choosing the greatest desire under compatibilistic free will isn't determinism, just through the desire. And so this seems to make compatibilism work since free will in itself already includes deterministic elements. Okay, uh, let me try to see. I um, want to know how choosing the greatest desire under compatibilistic free will isn't determinism via the desire. So the, the issue of choosing one's greatest desire is simply one way that uh, compatibilists have traditionally phrased um, what happens when you choose what you're determined to choose, right? So when you uh, decide to do an action, uh, the, the compatibilists tend to say, look, this is what you most wanted to do on that moment, right? And so the, your choice is determined by your desires. Um, so And that's fine as a way of explaining what's happening there. It's actually a strength, uh, allegedly, of uh, the compatibilist view because it's a little bit more difficult on the incompatibilist to explain what happens in inclination, right? Because there's got to be some discontinuity in your inclination. Um, this is a point that I think, I think uh, Daniel Dennett highlights pretty well. He says it would be really weird, like how late in the decision-making process does indeterminism kick in? Right. You, you're starting to be inclined one way. You're, con you're contemplating your two options. You're starting to be uh, attracted to one and your desire to take this one is growing, growing. And then you get closer to your choice. You say, yeah, this is probably what I'll do uh, and do it. He says, if it's super late in the decision making process, that indeterminism kick in, kicks in and that you end up choosing the other one. It doesn't sound like the sort of process that leads to a morally responsible choice. Sorry. It, it sounds more like a fluke that you were about to choose one and then up oh, the indeterminism kicked in and the, the other. So there's some work of explanation by the incompatibilist to give an account of inclination and one that will include that discontinuity without making it weird. Um, so I think that's, that's the context uh, and the compatibilist tend to say, yeah, you choose what you most wanted at that moment and what you most want is a continuity of just the evolution of your desire. So now onto the question. So how is that piece under the compatibilist model, the fact that we are choosing our greatest desire, how is it not determinism via the desire? I wouldn't say that it's not. I think that it's determinism, right? On, on compatibilism, we affirm determinism via the desire. Yes, your, de your desires are uh, just simply determining the outcome of the choice in the specific circumstances in which you are. And so this seems to make compatibilism work since free will in itself already includes deterministic elements. That's the part I'm not sure I understand. I don't know if it's an objection. It seems to say compatibilism works. So I'm on board with that. <laughs> I think that compatibilism, compatibilism works, um, but free will in itself already includes deterministic elements. I don't think that the incompatibilist is going to accept that. I think that 
uh, you, you don't want to confuse determinations, uh, like, sorry, you don't want to confuse some influencing factors that are there to influence your choice and the thesis of determinism where you have actual determination of the outcome, that is that it's necessitated by those prior factors. I don't think an incompatibilist would affirm that. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we can therefore say, well, look, you have desires, therefore compatibilism is true. I wish it were that simple to argue my case, but I don't think it works. The incompatibilist is going to say, no, 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 we have desires, we have influences, uh, but you're still indetermined in what you choose. Um, but I, I don't think there's an objection against compatibilism either here. So I think we're safe. All right. It looks like there are two questions left. I said I would stop the time now, but since there's only two, I'm going to stretch hard, hard line. No more questions after that. All right. So this question comes from Jordan Thornburg. How are non-elect sinners not the victims of God's decree? I suppose it's going to depend again on what we mean by victim, right? So they are not uh, passive. On my view, they are fully morally responsible. So I think there might be some uh, some aspect of uh, of like you might say that they are unfortunate or that, that they are something that's that's bad that's happening to them. That's that's bad. Um, and I think that the Calvinist is going to try to model this along the lines of what's said in Romans 9, that God has some vessels for destruction and it's a tough teaching to swallow, but uh, that that doesn't mean there is unrighteousness with God and who are you meant to respond back to God? No, the, 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 the classic answers on the question of the non-elect, but does not God have the right to do that? It seems to be uh, Paul's rhetorical point in that uh, chapter. So I wouldn't call them victims of God's decree because the language is very prejudicial. Uh, I would agree that it's something bad that's happening to them and it's fully under the providence of God. But again, on the compatibilist view, it still remains that they are morally responsible for not uh, coming to repentance and faith in Jesus, um, pre presum presuming that they've been uh, presented with the offer of the gospel, right? So let's not confuse moral responsibility for repenting and coming to faith and accepting the gospel with moral responsibility for sinning at all to begin with. Right, the, the, the two are a bit different. So the fact that we are sinning make, means that we are guilty and we are morally responsible and therefore we stand under judgment. And then there is this lifeline that God sends to uh, the elect by bringing them to faith in Jesus. Um, and both of those are morally responsible. But you, you don't want to say that the, those who never hear the gospel, for example, are blameworthy for rejecting Jesus or something strong like that. Uh, I, I don't think that even on compatibilism, that's, that would be the case. Um, but no one is excusable, right? So uh, we are all without excuse, and uh, yet we are morally responsible for what we do under God's decree on the Calvinist view, indeed. All right, last question. Why, in spite of all you say, do I feel the proposition determinism dissolves moral responsibility, has the same ethical certainty and reasonableness as torturing people for fun is wrong? Well, I guess it's not. It's because I'm not a good enough philosopher, and I need to work harder <laughs> on my arguments. <laughs> I think some of them are really good, uh, so we we differ on their assessments. Uh, obviously, I can give the very hard-hearted answer to say, well, that's because you're full of sin. Obviously, no. I mean, obviously, this is you know, why. Do, do, do you feel that this is just as certain? I, I can only guess. Um, but you know, I think I'm trying to, my best to offer the best arguments to make uh, an opinion. And it, it might be actually a, a good place to mention some uh, reconciliation note. Um, I've voiced a couple of benefits uh, to Christian theology of the view that I take, but I, I think it's helpful to mention that uh, I think that Christians have more in common uh, when they agree on the gospel and the essentials of the faith uh, than they do when they differ on free will. So um, if somebody, if after all of my valiant efforts, uh, just like this uh, listeners, uh, you're not convinced that uh, the determinism would uh, not remove more responsibility, then I would prefer that you don't affirm determinism until I can convince you that compatibilism is true. Don't go around denying God's goodness or human moral responsibility um, just because I don't do enough of a good job uh, and you, you affirm determinism and, and compatibilism. So I would prefer you're not a Calvinist and you're still a Christian who affirm God's goodness and uh, moral responsibility. Uh, rather than to have you forced into the compatibilist mold and then uh, deny some really important things about the Christian faith. 
All right. Well, I really enjoyed this interview, Dr. Bignon. So thank you so much for taking a lot of time this evening to uh, discuss this. Thank you for inviting me. Make sure you check out my previous interview with Dr. Perry Boom and uh, Ann Taylor Sear. In December, I have what I'm thinking right now anyway, will be the final interview in this series on human freedom. And that one will be with Dr. Chris Franklin on, and he'll be defending libertarian freedom. So uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.